Have it out with Galloway. That's the idea. Come and have a go. If you think you're hard enough, you can be on the video wall with me and with my distinguished panelists. It's Gaza again. How could it be otherwise? The slaughter continues. Rafa being bombed, threatened with being invaded. Is there going to be a cease fire? And if it is, will it be a pause for humanitarian reasons? Quickly followed by a resumption of fire. How far will the fire go? Is the ethnic cleansing going to be over anytime soon? And if so, why has Israel just tendered for 20,000 12-person tents, meaning that a quarter of a million Palestinians are destined for a tent somewhere. Where will that somewhere be? In the Gaza Strip? Or will they be pushed next door into the Sinai in Egypt? If they are, will they go? If they go, will they go quietly? If they are forced to go by a genocidal act of ethnic cleansing, what will Israel's friendly governments in Western countries do about it? Joe Biden finally demanded a complete ceasefire. It's only taken him six months and a little more. What was it that persuaded Biden that finally enough people had been killed? Each and every one of us knows it was the disgraceful murder of seven Western aid workers in the Gaza Strip, Australians, Canadians, Americans, British people, Irish people. It was the murder of seven white European people or people of European stock that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Well, that makes the relative rate of exchange in value between Palestinian blood and white European blood, roughly 5,000 to 1. I've always said, have said, thousands of times that the blood of Westerners is far more valuable than the blood of Arabs for the blood of Palestinians. But who knew it would be quite such an imbalance, 5,000 to 1. For sure, the shock value to the media and the political class of the slaying of, by a deliberate rocket attack, one after the other, on three separate vehicles in Gaza, through the roof, blowing to smithereens these human beings who were only there trying to bring aid, trying to bring some relief to people who have suffered so much. I mean, if you're not shocked at that, you're probably no longer a sentient human being. But it was amazing to watch the media and politicians who had been entirely unmoved by all the slaughter hitherto, the slaughter that was breaking our hearts, was keeping us awake at night, was something invisible to them. But they were forced by what happened to the aid workers to sit up and take notice because, well, there are elections coming. As the great Englishman of letters, Dr. Johnson, put it, nothing concentrates the mind more than the knowledge that one is to be hanged in the morning. Well, politicians, metaphorically, are hanged at election times or fear that they might be. Joe Biden is in very serious trouble in the presidency of the United States. And Rishi Sunak, the British Prime Minister, is already a dead duck and the leader of the opposition in Britain, Sir Kid Starver, as I call him, is not really any more popular than the prime minister he is set to oust. Little Schultz in Germany can barely muster 20% in the public opinion polls. Little Macron on his throne in the Elysee isn't even as popular as that. All over the Western world, the truth is, these politicians are busted flush. And they are unable to get out of the vice-like grip of public apathy, public enmity, and active 
public opposition on the issue of Palestine and Gaza. So I'm joined by two great guests and by a studio, studio audience that I can't wait to meet, can't wait for you to meet. This is Have It Out with Galloway. Dr. Mustafa Barghouti is a member of parliament, leader of the Palestinian National Initiative, advocating for human rights and democracy. He's serving in the Palestinian legislative and central councils, and he's a minister. He founded the Palestinian Medical Relief Society and was a 2010 Nobel Peace Prize nominee. And Miko Pellet is an Israeli author and activist. He contributes to publications, writes a blog, and produces the Miko Peled podcast, dedicated to advocating for the creation of one democratic state with equal rights for Israelis and Palestinians. He's been arrested several times by the Israeli authorities for his activism. He's written several books on the topic of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Miko Peled joins me at first. Uh, Miko, thanks uh, for doing so. At the time of recording, we can't know if there is a ceasefire and if there is, how long it will last, if it's intended as the first step in a comprehensive solution uh, to the issue or merely a pause for breath, for resupply and a return to the mass murder again. I know that you uh, are very skeptical about the whole concept of a ceasefire, but of course, uh, many in the world simply cannot bear the current state of the conflict to continue. And all of those on the ground in Gaza are desperate uh, for even a pause. So where do you think we are at? What juncture are we at? A turning point or merely a pause before more of the same? Well, thank you for having me and thank you for allowing me to be on the panel with Dr. Uh, Mustafa. Look, like I said before, the, the, whole, the whole idea of, of uh, confronting genocide with a ceasefire is ludicrous. It's grotesque. Palestinians are being murdered in, in, in rates that are unimaginable. And, uh, and, and the world is waiting for the perpetrators of the genocide to agree to the terms of a ceasefire. People who care about the Palestinian people, people who want to see an end to the genocide, an end to the suffering and the oppression, need to stand up and immediately demand severe sanctions, an embargo on weapons, a naval blockade that will uh, that, against the state of Israel, a no-fly zone over Gaza, and billions of dollars for the rebuilding and rehabilitation of, of Gaza and its people. Nothing less than that will stop the killing. If anybody is under the illusion that a ceasefire will end the suffering and the killing of Palestinians, they're out of their minds. There's an almost 80-year history. You know, the first, the first uh, ceasefire agreements or armistice agreements were signed in, in February of 1949, and Israel has, been, has violated them as soon as it's almost before the ink was dry. Israel violates agreements on a regular basis. The expectation that a ceasefire will end the killing and the suffering is absolutely absurd. It's absolutely, people have to be absolutely out of their minds to accept the notion that somehow Israel will respect it. There have to be severe sanctions. Anybody who cares needs to demand of their governments, whether these are elected governments or not, it makes no difference. We need to demand from our governments to end all trade with Israel, to close down diplomatic missions. Israel is a genocidal, maniacal regime that has to be dismantled and qu as quickly as humanly possible. Nothing less than that. Can you imagine waiting for Hitler to agree to the terms of a ceasefire while he was murdering uh, millions of people? It is absolutely ludicrous. There should be no talk of ceasefire. There should be no agreement. Israel must unconditionally release the, all the, the hostages that it has taken over the decades. There's about 10,000 of them right now in Israeli prisons. They must release them unconditionally. Like I said before, there has to be an embargo on weapons, a no-fly zone over Gaza, and billions allocated to the rehabilitation of Gaza and its people. And this needs to be done unconditionally and immediately. 
Uh, Dr. Mustafa Barghouti, an 80-year story, as uh, Miko Peled uh, says, half of which you and I have been working together. 40 years ago, we first met, uh, and uh, we're still talking about the same thing. We're still talking even about many of the same uh, people. Uh, Miko Peled laid out there what might be called uh, the maximum program, and I agreed with every single word of what he said, uh, but we're not going to get there anytime soon, uh, which doesn't mean we don't fight for it, but we're not going to get there tomorrow or the next day. What's your take on what the next days and weeks likely hold for your people? I think when we look at the situation, it is very clear that uh, the Israeli fascist establishment does not want to end this war. Uh, actually, today, Galant said, uh, the chief of the, the, the minister of defense in Israel said that they want to get back the uh, Israeli prisoners and then they want to proceed with the war. And Netanyahu just declared that he has a date for his attack on Rafah. These two people, as well as the whole Israeli establishment, know very well that the end of the war is the end of their political future. They will be, once the war is over, they will be uh, investigated for their failure on the 7th of October. They will be, Netanyahu in particular, will be also judged, uh, he and the Israeli army, for their failure in conducting this war. And uh, third, uh, Netanyahu himself will be facing four cases of corruption, each of which could take him to jail. So all these the people don't want to stop the war. They want maybe under American pressure, uh, they, they might want some kind of temporary arrangement. But that's not what Palestinians want, of course. And that's not what Palestinian resistance will agree with. Uh, in my opinion, Israel now is under pressure from two sides. The first side is the Palestinian resistance and the fact that Israel has failed drastically in achieving its goals thanks to the heroism of the Palestinian people. They failed to destroy resistance. They failed to reoccupy Gaza. They failed to bring back their prisoners by force. And they failed in conducting the ethnic cleansing of Gaza, which was the main goal of their attack. On the other hand, there is another kind of pressure taking place, which is the pressure of the peoples of the world, which we appreciate very much. We, we, we are very proud of this huge international, I would call it revolution in support of Palestine. And it is spreading everywhere, including in the United States. If Biden didn't know that he's just about to lose elections because of his support and participation in these war crimes in Gaza, he would not have changed any of his positions an inch. But he sees now the pressure. In my opinion, our goal is not just a ceasefire, but we want to stop the killing of our people immediately. 40,000 Palestinians have been killed, mainly civilians. More than 15,000 of them are children. Uh, that, of course, if we include those who are under the rubble. And uh, more than 76,000 people have been injured, many of whom will die because there is no medical treatment for them after Israel has destroyed most of the hospitals. So we need to stop this tragedy immediately. And then, of course, the goal is not just to have ceasefire. And it's not just to get the Israeli army out of Gaza. And it's not just to end occupation. It is actually, and here I agree with Miko, the goal must be to bring down this whole settler colonial system that the Zionist movement have created in Palestine. Thank you, uh, both uh, of our distinguished panelists. So we've got a rather distinguished wall in front of me. Dr. Mustafa talked about the worldwide movement. It's represented on this wall, people from all over the world. Let's have uh, some responses to what you've heard uh, so far. Mohsen Farkani is in Tehran, in Iran. Mohsen, what do you think of what you've heard? What would you like to say? Good evening, George. Uh, my condolences, uh, my condolences uh, to kids, mothers, men, uh, and women in Gaza. 
I would like to condemn assassination uh, of the martyr general Mohammad Reza Zahedi, uh, who was assassinated last week in Iranian uh, consulate in uh, Damascus by warplanes of genocidal terror regime of Israel. Uh, he was an Iranian official advisor in Damascus. And um, Israeli airstrike uh, destroyed, um, actually, uh, the Iranian um, consulate and killed seven official figures and advisors, uh, which reflects uh, double standards uh, for the uh, U.S. allies. Uh, this strike didn't uh, just assassinate an Iranian hero, but also was an explicit cold shoulder of the Zionist regime uh, to Vienna Convention 1961 uh, 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 and the Syrian territorial integrity, which uh, means an attack uh, to two nas nations and states. Then uh, any retaliatory action from Iran or Syria is totally uh, legitimate and conventional. Uh, that is nowadays also repeatedly a request of Iranians. And uh, my question for you um, is whether you think actions of uh, British pro Palestine movements have any uh, effects on uh, Britain's foreign policy, especially regarding UK Israel relations. Thank you, well, George. Uh, undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly, they have, uh, or the leaders of Britain's political parties would not have moved from outright opposition uh, to an end to the killing to ever more frantically demanding more uh, uh, killing to uh, desperately seeking now a ceasefire uh, for the reasons that Dr. Mustafa just explained, uh, that uh, Joe Biden has uh, called for a, a ceasefire now, not because too many Palestinians have died, but because too many Biden votes have disappeared. Too many Democratic votes have gone down the drain with the blood of so many uh, innocents. Uh, Miko Pellet, uh, the movement in the United States has also been a great one. It has moved Biden. Doesn't seem to have moved the Congress much. The APAC purchased political class in the United States is still pretty gung-ho, isn't it? Yes, it is. And I think what we're hearing from Biden and uh, maybe some of the other uh, politicians here is lip service. It's nothing more than lip service. I mean, their they're, they're people, their constituents, people within the Democratic Party are demanding that uh, Biden uh, start talking about a ceasefire. There is a siege around the embassy of Israel here in Washington, D.C. that's been going on with activists uh, surrounding it uh, for, for over a month now. There's a siege. They're calling it a settlement. There's a siege uh, around the home of Anthony Blinken that's been going on even longer with people protesting and demanding, uh, uh, you know, demanding justice for Palestinians. But I think what we're hearing, we're not, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we have reached a point where the grassroots activism has actually managed to penetrate the halls of power where decisions are actually made or the boardrooms uh, in, in where decisions are made if it's the press or, or corporations and so forth. So I don't, I don't believe we're there yet. I think we're, the, the grassroots um, response that we're seeing, which is, which is overwhelming, of course, and, and, and is uh, heartwarming in many ways, is still not organized enough to penetrate the halls of power to change policy. I mean, Biden, uh, and, uh, you know, they just approved the administration just approved another uh, bill, another God knows how many billions in dollars and 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 missiles and so forth, knowing full well this is going to murder innocent people. So, while we do see you know a lot of activism and a lot of wonderful initiatives on a regular basis every single day throughout all of, throughout Washington D.C. We are not yet at a place where we have reached uh, where we can, I believe, make a make a difference in terms of of the politics and and policy regarding uh, regarding Israel. Let's take a, a question uh, from Charles Kelly in London. Charles, good evening, George, and everybody. Um, can I play devil's advocate here and, and maybe give you a little something to challenge you? Um, sure. Uh, I, I don't disagree with anything that's been said tonight, uh, and I'm certainly not a fan of. Netanyahu, um, the comeback kid. I, I don't know how he's even in power. It must be one of the, the greatest comebacks since Lazarus. Um, and, and I certainly don't agree with the way he was 
almost smirking when he he was interviewed last week when he made this announcement about the killing of the the the, the, the aid workers when he just said well these things happen and some people have been hurt well no they weren't hurt they were they were killed um however i, I just want to address the elephant in the room because Nobody has mentioned uh, the, the role of Hamas here um, and, you know, what, what they've done and, and, and they're still today. I, I don't hear much from Hamas. I don't hear any uh, anything about Hamas. Or, and, and it seems to me that uh, they've they've allowed this to happen, that they've now correct me if I'm wrong. But what do you think about what, what the role of Hamas in this and, and what they could have done maybe to avoid this war? Well, you say avoid this war. I presume you mean the stage of the war which began okay. on October the 7th, because, of course, the war has never ended. I uh, said earlier that the first time I met Dr. Mustafa Barghouti was in 1984, uh, and there was already war in the occupied territories. There was war uh, against the Palestinian people in Lebanon, uh, still going on. There was a full-scale Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982. Uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is almost 80 years long, and Hamas are not even 40 years old. So an attempt to, as it were, uh, pretend that the uh, existence of Hamas, the program of Hamas, the actions of Hamas lie at the heart of this matter is belied by the simple chronology, by the uh, simple history. I'm not myself a supporter of Hamas. I, I have always been an Arafat man. Uh, but the idea that the Palestinians in Gaza, which was effectively a concentration camp uh, before the guards set about completely annihilating the people inside it, uh, was going to remain quiescent forever, is simply fanciful and flies in the face of what people in concentration camps do. Uh, the people in the Warsaw Ghetto did not go quietly into their good night. They rose up in an uprising against the people who had concentrated them and wished them to die singly and quietly, they decided better to uh, die on our feet. Let me ask uh, uh, the Dr. Mustafa if he wants to supplement that uh, answer in any way. Dr. Mustafa? Yes, thank you. Well, uh, two issues here one has to remember. First of all, as you said, the history here did not start on the 7th of October. We've been subjected to ethnic cleansing for uh, more than 76 years now. We've been subjected to the longest military occupation in modern history since 1967. We've been subjected to a system of apartheid that is much worse than what prevailed in South Africa. And we've been all victims of a settler colonial system that has committed crimes against Palestinians one day after the other. And uh, the, there was a time when uh, Fatah was leading the military struggle. And at that time, Fatah was accused, and the PLO was accused of being uh, terrorists. Then uh, they made peace with these terrorists. And uh, the PLO concluded an agreement, a peace agreement with Israel, which is called the Oslo Agreement, uh, which had many flaws in it, unfortunately. And they thought, now we will make peace with our enemy. And uh, the first Israeli reaction was to kill Itzhak Rabin, who assigned the agreement with the, with the Palestinians. And who aggravated the Israeli public to kill Itzhak Rabin? It was Netanyahu, who made his polit whole political career based on rejecting any possibility of peace or two-state solution. That's his legacy. So those who went in the direction of thinking that they would have negotiations with Israel discovered that Israel has no place for neither negotiations, nor peace, nor anything. And the very clear proof to that, it's not just Netanyahu, it's the whole Zionist movement. Most recently in the Israeli Knesset, 
99 uh, out of 110 Jewish members of the Knesset voted against a Palestinian state. So Hamas did what Fatah and PLO did before. They, they used struggle, including military struggle, to end occupation, to end this injustice. And uh, in, I think on the 7th of October, they, they were in a way a victims of their own success because nobody expected that the second largest Israeli military brigade and the strongest, second strongest in the Israeli army will just fall apart in three and a half hours. And then things happen. Uh, there was a very good Palestinian writer who, who, who said once, never blame the victim. And in this case, one should not blame the Palestinian side, but ask the question, what drove us into this situation? Who is responsible for the continuation of occupation? Who is responsible for the ethnic cleansing? Who is responsible now for a terrible genocide that is committed against the Palestinian people? And well, they uh, a, a lot of uh, blood flowed on October 7th and has flowed uh, ever since, uh, Doctor. Uh, I suppose my uh, purpose with Mr. Kelly was to just to establish that it has been flowing uh, for a very long time and it is overwhelmingly Palestinian blood that has uh, flown. Let me, I'm trying to get more people in. Let me take Ash Khan from Bradford in the United Kingdom. Ash, what would you like to say? Hi, yes. Yeah. So I'd like to ask a question to George. Do world leaders like Rishi Sunak, Joe Biden, and most leaders past and present uh, favor the needs of the super rich? Do they use the system to exploit uh, the people they are meant to serve? An example of that being Rishi Sunak awarding an NHS IT contract to his father-in-law, which in the end means millions for himself. And like the war in Gaza and all wars, it's all money, it all boils down to money for themselves and the super rich. What do you think of that, George? Do governments in the West favour the super rich? Is the Pope a Catholic? Do bears defecate in the woods? Nothing could be more obvious that the political class in Western countries serves primarily the interests of the, uh, the, the rich, the wealthy, the powerful, uh, but there's a new phenomenon, uh, which is why I think it's a worthwhile question uh, rather than a statement of the bleeding obvious. Uh, and it's this, that increasingly the politicians themselves are enriching themselves, intending themselves to become part of the super rich. That's new. That's something that occurred since uh, Tony Blair, since the advent of uh, Blairism. Uh, one of the many disadvantages of electing young men into power is that they are going to be around for a long time and going to make a lot of money out of the decisions they made when they were in office. Mr. Blair, who's a year or two older than me and still looks like he's got a lot of earning potential uh, lying ahead uh, of him. Uh, it's very new in Britain uh, that politicians become vastly rich. They normally get a title, a bauble, uh, a, a twice annual invitation to the palace uh, for a tea party with the queen and settle down to write their memoirs. But now they go out of office and into the boardroom and into international big business. I suppose, Miko Pellet, in the US, it's always been that way. Oh, God forbid, no. Uh, politicians in America have always been as straight as an arrow. There's no corruption. There's no, uh, especially especially um, uh, during the administration of, of Donald Trump. Uh, I mean, there were no wrongdoings whatsoever. I mean, Americans are very, very strict about, about um, separating their business interests and their wealth from their service to the people. So, no, I don't think in the U.S. at all there's, uh, th this is true uh, at all, like you said, um, you know, about the Pope being Catholic. But yes, of course, I mean, I mean, people always wonder why America supports Israel so much. And there are many reasons. Uh, some of it has to do with the fact that Americans receive a Zionist education. So Americans are Zionists, whether 
they like it or not. But the other reason is that a lot of the money that is given to Israel in foreign aid comes back here into the pockets of, of weapons manufacturers and others. So I mean, you follow you follow the money and you and you find the culprit. There's no question about that. And this is true for and and the American political system allows for this, you know, for lobbying, you know, for very heavy lobbying. So you've got the the arms industry, the the guns industry for low for domestic um, consumption. You've got the pharmaceutical companies and so forth that have uh, that, that control Congress, that control uh, the House of Representatives, they control they control the administration, regardless if the administration is is Democrat or Republican. So certainly America yeah. has been built on this, and they're very proud of the fact that this is how the political system works in America. It's the, the American way. Let's go to Valencia in Spain. Uh, Chema Sanchez. Uh, forgive me if I didn't pronounce your first name properly. Chema is difficult for <laughs> the British to say. Go ahead, Mr. Sanchez. Yes, I have a, a joke because the sun warning in China uh, thought, thought that I uh, uh, super rich because he he told me like Texman, Texman, the man of the oil of Texas. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, okay. it's like Go ahead. Really. Go ahead. My, my name. Well, uh, my question, and, and now there is a clear position of countries looking for a new multipolar goal and those that just don't want to upset the bully hegemonic country that is trying to keep that them as obedient subjects. There is two clear axes, in my point of view, anti-imperialist countries and obedient governments. My question is, don't you think that the people all around the world must be on the side of the leaders of the new multipolar world and against the Anglo-Saxon Zionist empire? And why don't you think the leaders of a new, a more independent and free world are clearly and properly Xi and Putin? And secondly, why do we go without any logical reason against the countries that never try to impose their rules to the rest? And why don't we go and help to break the chains of colonialism by breaking the old institutions in Europe and Europe itself, by the way, and free their government at the last? Thank you, George. Well, the, the old world is dying. Uh, to paraphrase uh, Gramsci, uh, the old world is dying, uh, but the new world is actually uh, rather slow to be born. Uh, and that's why this morbidity, this rule of monsters, is persisting uh, for uh, so long. If the New World was already born, then the Chinese Navy would already have docked in Gaza, and uh, the Russian army would have already liberated uh, the uh, Golan Heights uh, and returned it to Syria. Uh, the, the New World is not yet ready to contest uh, for uh, power um, everywhere in the world at the same time. Uh, they, are, they continue to be uh, incapable, unwilling, if not incapable, to do that. So it's not quite as easy as calling for it. Of course, I'd love to see what you asked for, but I'm not sure I'm going to be around long enough to actually see it, though my children will, I hope. Let's go to New York City, where a man I know well, a legend on the mother of all talk shows, Erobus, is waiting to ask a question in New York City. Go ahead, Erobus. Greetings and salutations, Mr. Galloway. Thank you. Finally meet you uh, digitally face-to-face, -face yes. and a salubrious evening to your guests and the entire panel. Uh, it's a magnificent segue to my question, which, you know, at the risk of being redundant, which you've heard before. However, for the benefit of those of you that have never heard this question from me, you know, my question is simply, you know, there, there, there has to come a time, you know, I was just looking at a quote by Chas Freeman, who was an old school uh, American diplomat going back to the days of uh, Nixon. And he said, what was accomplished on the battlefield will determine what will be negotiated on the table. You know, so, you know, we need a, a direct kinetic intervention. And, you know, in order for this to stop, I want to know when that's going to happen and what it's going to look like. Because the people shuffling around these papers in the UN, they mean well, but it's not going to accomplish the change that's needed. 
I don't have to remind you, Mr. Galloway, because you was there. You were there in South Africa, and I was not, you know, during apartheid. It was the intervention of the Soviet Union and their allies, Cuba and Angola, you know, directly fighting apartheid, you know, with bullets and bombs and shells and all of that. And unfortunately, this is what it's going to have to come to, to liberate Palestine. We are past the point of good wishes and meaning well and, and, and thoughts and prayers and all of that. You know, so I, I wanted to know, at the risk of, of being redundant again, how is that going to look like, the intervention? You know, it's already taken place, with the axis of resistance. You know, Richard Methurst has been doing really well showing these updates. But it has to be more, you know, and from the perspective, mm -hmm. what's that going to look like and, and what do you anticipate? Very good question, uh, Miko, uh, starting with you in the, in the U.S., uh, what's it going to look like? Uh, you know, we hear a lot about axis of resistance, and it's uh, very clear the Arab world is divided uh, into two parts, uh, one which is, uh, to a lesser or greater extent, involved in supporting the resistance, uh, but there's also an axis of acceptance uh, which is, to a lesser or greater extent, a part of the problem uh, and is actually, in some cases, brazenly assisting uh, the Israeli siege and massacre of the Palestinians. Uh, what's it going to look like if that's going to change? You know, I don't know that, that, that we need to judge uh, the Arab states any differently than we judge any other states. Um, you know, an Arab leader looks around the world today, looks at his, look at looks at the countries around surrounding um, uh, surrounding him today, and he sees the you know he sees uh, Iraq and Yemen and Syria and Libya and so on, and then he sees the other countries and has to make a, a decision on uh, how uh, what, what is what is his or her you know what is the his government's responsibility to their country. And so there's a. This is not an easy place to be uh, for for the Arab governments today, and for many years actually. Um, so that's 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 one question. I mean, I don't think the the Arab states are any worse or better than the Europeans or or the Africans or anybody else who are also completely supportive or the Indians. Of uh, yeah, uh, but uh, Doctor Mustafa, uh, that's true, of course. Uh, but you would expect more uh, from uh, fellow Arab countries, wouldn't you? You'd have the right to say. Uh, you people are fasting and praying and uh, in some cases are never done telling us how pious you are, but your co-religionists are being slaughtered in great number and you're not doing anything about it. Well, to be honest with you, I, uh, since 1967, I stopped uh, expecting much from uh, the government in this region. And uh, in 1967, we learned a very good lesson that we have to uh, have three principles in our struggle, self-reliance, self-organization, and defying the Israeli uh, uh, establishment and the Israeli occupation and oppression. And uh, that was the core uh, idea of the first intifada and then the second intifada, and then what you see today. Uh, I don't want people to feel pessimistic at all. In reality, I believe this fight here in Palestine today has inspired the whole, all, all the progressive and revolutionary forces in the whole world. A small group of people with very limited amount of resources uh, besieged for 17 years and with a very limited amount of power managed to stop the Israeli army already for six months, and the Israeli army is failing to achieve its goals. The whole almighty Israeli army that defeated all the Arab countries, uh, or the three of the main Arab countries in 1967 in six days, you know that the losses on the Israeli side uh, during these six months is larger than all the, their uh, losses in the 67 war when they defeated three Arab armies and occupied a land that was three times the size of what Israel is. So no, I am. I feel optimistic, and I think that the people in Palestine are inspiring the world. There is one thing we need to do more, and our friends need to do more, 
whether we are talking about Arab peoples or the the world community of uh, people who support Palestine, the most important thing is to get better organized. The problem with the progressive forces is that they do not organize well and they don't organize efficiently and effectively. And I believe this is the goal. And regarding the solidarity with Palestine, now it has to transform into a very clear organization of boycott, divestment, sanctions on Israel, exactly like was done in the case of the apartheid system in South Africa. Two Thanks, things uh, would stop thank the Israeli you, Doctor. Establishment. Let me just take another question, if I may. Uh, Desmond Thompson in London, United Kingdom. Desmond? Yes, go Good ahead, evening, sir. George. Yeah, good evening, George, and to everyone on the panel and the guests from planet Earth. Uh, my question is, uh, isn't it time now for the UN or a even private organization to research and find out about the nuclear weapons of mass destruction that has uh, been stored in uh, Israel for a long, long time? Um, and also the politicians in the UK that voted uh, a few weeks ago for the bombing to uh, continue using the label uh, voting for or against the ceasefire, which actually meant the continuation of the extermination of the people of Gaza. Uh, and people talk about the war in Gaza. It is not a war. It's an extermination. The, the, the Palestinians are so underarmed, it's unbelievable. Underarmed, original... but uh, as uh, Dr. Mustafa just said, uh, have inflicted more uh, damage on the Israeli armed forces than three Arab armies managed to do in the Six-Day War. Uh, so uh, it's important not to, uh, as it were, talk them down uh, because their achievement is enormous. Arafat used to talk of the Palestinians as the 300 Spartans holding the pass at uh, Thermopylae. Uh, and uh, in a way, not many more than 300 Palestinian fighters have been doing that in Gaza for six whole months. Let's take David Hancock in West Yorkshire, uh, Todd Morden. Uh, David, thanks. What would you like to say quickly? Hey, up, George. You all right? Yeah, good. Nice to hear from you. Yeah. Um, have you heard of the um, FARA in America, the Foreign a Agent Registration Act? Yes. Yeah, yes. well, I was looking into it and uh, I found a little little kind of irony um, when JFK got assassinated. Just before that, he was pushing in the federal courts for um, what was then the uh, American Zionist Council, which is now APAC to uh, register them as a foreign agent, which would then mean that they would have to, um, you know, register their accounts and where they get the money from. And um, in the October, there were forms sent out to the uh, American Zionist Council to register as a foreign agent. And then in the November, that was October, in the November, JFK got assassinated. And then in December, um, the AZC refused to register. Nothing else was ever chased up about it again. And in the uh, legislation um, from the Department of Justice, it says, and I quote, anyone that represents the interests of the foreign principle before any agency or official of the US government. That is the definition in regard to foreign agents. Um, well, look, just... uh, there's not much doubt uh, that the uh, Capitol Hill, as someone famously once said, is occupied territory uh, in the sense that the political class are financially supported to an enormous degree uh, by the financial support of supporters of Israel, most of them not Jewish, by the way. Uh, most of the uh, supporters of Israel that pay for the political process in the U.S. are not Jewish. And it's an important uh, distinction uh, to make. Miko, you got a comment on that? Uh, is there any need for APAC to register as uh, foreign agents? Everyone knows what's going on, don't they? 
Well, APAC is, I think the mistake that people make is they think that APAC is it. APAC is just a part of a very, very large uh, web of, uh, of Zionist organizations in the United States. And we have to, like I said this earlier, Americans receive a fully Zionist education system. Zionism is in every textbook. There are Zionist organizations that check the social studies textbooks in ch for, for children in school. Um, there are there's Zionist influence. You know, Zionists have, have been have been building relationships for from over the, over a hundred years with the media, with politicians, with cultural figures. Zionism is part of American culture. Zionism is part of the American education system. It's part of philanthropy. I mean, Zionism is so deeply rooted in 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 American and I believe in British too uh, society and life and culture. That you know, APAC is just the very last step at the top of the process. Making sure the politicians don't forget, you know, wh Who where their, their loyalty millions. needs yeah. to lie. So Joe Biden has had five million, by the way, Miko, uh, over the course of his uh, career, uh, and uh, that's what we know about. That's on top of the table. Who knows? With Joe Biden, there may have been a few dollars slipped underneath it. Let's go. Stay in Yorkshire, but North Yorkshire this time. Scarborough, Scarlet. What would you like to say, Scarlet? Hello, it's lovely to speak with you. Thank you, ma'am. I have personally been doing some research into the voting within our country, and I wanted to discuss with you the physical barriers preventing some people from voting in our country. For anybody that's classed as homeless or having no fixed address, it is made incredibly difficult for them, even though they should have the right to vote. When I looked into it in my area, if somebody doesn't have the access to the internet or to a printer, for example, they then have to use the local amenities to go and get their forms printed and to then pay for the postage, which equivalents here to about £4.80. For anybody who is significantly financially struggling, which most people who don't have a fixed address and those people who are classed as homeless very much are, this amount is the amount of a meal or multiple meals, a hot drink. Obviously, our current politicians wouldn't understand that £4.80 can be an awful lot of money to somebody. And my question for you is, do you think that this is a potentially deliberate political move from our government? Because they know that the people who are financially struggling the most will not offer them a vote. No, I don't think that. I think they just don't care and that wouldn't cross their mind. It's not a deliberate decision on their part. Uh, look, I, I promise I'll look into what you've said. I promise I'll take it up uh, uh, when I have done. Uh, but I want to I want to press on on this subject of Gaza Palestine and go to uh, Bradford again. Phil McCowan this time. Phil, what would you like to say? Uh, Phil has uh, dropped out. It's a pity because he wanted to promote me to foreign secretary. I would have liked to have answered that. Tarek Othman in Luton. What would you like to say, Tarek? Hi, George. Uh, just uh, a first question. I think you mentioned uh, last last um, last uh, show that you were you were coming to Luton at some point soon, and yes. I, I wondered if you had any details on that because I, I I'd love to attend if I could. And um, with regards to, of course, the the subject of the show, I think an important question that uh, came to my mind just now is um, there's a lot of talk of where Zionism is going, where Israel is going. Um, and I think it's important to, to understand different people's viewpoints on where it should be going and to understand, of course, what the distinguished guests uh, with, with us here today would like to see in the future uh, and what the obstacles to that are and how those obstacles do you think could be, could, could, could be overcome. Well, I have uh, firm views on it. I think all of us uh, do. Now, uh, let's go to Dr. Mustafa Barghouti. Uh, I suppose one of the themes of the evening has been, Doctor, what will this all look like? Uh, the position of uh, Miko, uh, and I suppose nowadays, now that Oslo has failed, also me, uh, 
uh, is that the struggle for a two-state solution with all its shortcomings, all its flaws, as you put it earlier, uh, is kind of dead in the water now. And that the far better solution, uh, albeit just as difficult to achieve, uh, is for this democratic, secular state between the river and the sea that we used to talk about before Oslo. Uh, where do you stand on that? And where do most Palestinians stand on that in your view? Well, uh, you know my position. I wrote uh, an article last year in May on the 75th anniversary of the Nakba, where I said that Israel has killed the two-state solution. And the only solution is one democratic state with equal rights for everybody. And uh, that means that uh, one democratic state will not be Jewish only state. Uh, and uh, it means that uh, there will be full and total equality. Uh, many people told, tell me that, uh, but Israelis don't accept one-state solution. And then I ask them, do they accept two-state solution? And of course, they don't accept two-state solution. They don't accept one-state solution. So what is the solution to the fact that we are today 7 million Palestinians on the land of historic Palestine versus uh, almost 7 million Jewish people? Uh, their solution is ethnic cleansing. That's exactly what they are trying to do now in Gaza through genocide. This is the Zionist plan, ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. And I believe that's why I say the most important goal now in Gaza is to keep the Palestinian people in their land and not to allow the ethnic cleansing and evicting the people out of Gaza. Uh, and I believe that the only solution practically is one democratic state. Now, if people want to say to states, you, they're most welcome, but they have to be clear. Nobody can speak about a Palestinian independent state without demanding at the same time the end of Israeli occupation, which started in 1967 completely, including in Jerusalem, without demanding the end not only of settlement activities, but the removal of all settlements from all occupied territories. None of the Western leaders who speak about two-state solution mention that. And that's why it looks like a hypocrisy when they speak about two-state solution without even daring to recognize Palestine. Why don't they recognize Palestine? They recognize already Israel. So in my opinion, the talk about two-state solution, especially in the case of the United States, is nothing but a hypocritic talk, a cover for the lack of action, and a way of trying to avoid their responsibility. That's why I believe our goal should be clear, not only ending occupation, and not only one democratic state, but more than that, the one democratic state will not work without bringing down totally the whole settler colonial project. That's the entry point, and that's what we have adopted in our most recent uh, most recent Congress in the, of the Palestinian National Initiative. What let's, Palestinians uh, ask, uh, support, let, let's support. take uh, another contribution, Doctor, from the wall. Uh, Dr. Mala, uh, where is Dr. Mala? Yes, Doctor, what would you like to say? Habibi, Habibi Joz, you can call me brother, you know, with all due respect. And, uh, you know, best greetings to you and to uh, to the two distinguished guests, to Brother Miko and uh, Brother Dr. Mustafa and everybody there. I want to say, uh, Gallo, uh, George, even though the time might be running out, one of the problem with, you know, uh, so many uh, organization around uh, the globe when it comes to Palestine, it's not only the lack of organizing, and but it is the lack of political clarity. And with all due respect to my dear brother, Mustafa Barghouti, 67 claim by the BDS is very big problem for many of us because Palestine is Palestine from the river to the sea back to 1948. If we're talking about occupation and ethnic cleansing, it started before 1948 either. You know, we all know history and maybe at one time, you know, based on your available time, George, you can have a specific uh, event uh, around to this. But I want to say briefly, last week, unfortunately, seven workers, <clears throat> You know, volunteers with the World Kitchen International lost their life and one Palestinian. So the mainstream media and the politicians focus on the seven and barely mention 
the Palestinian martyrs. However, the point is, with the total destruction of the health sector in Gaza, the execution of hundreds of doctors and nurses and workers in hospitals did not poke any shred of conscience you know, in the so-called global uh, leaders, but suddenly with the passing or with the killing of the seven worker, eight workers, you know, with the work kitchen, you know, work them up and they start talking about, you know, yeah, civilians. well, never, never, uh, never imagined that what you're watching is uh, conscience in uh, action, doctor. Uh, these people lack that. Uh, Miko Pellet, a last word from you, if I may. Uh, we now have agreement between you, me, and Dr. Mustafa uh, that there, the only real answer to this is a democratic state uh, between the river and the sea where Christians, Muslims, and Jews live as equal citizens under the law, which uh, looks like a tall order. But as Dr. Mustafa just pointed out, uh, the so-called two-state solution turned out to be a very tall order too, even if there was any intention to implement it in the first place. How optimistic are you that if not we, then our children will see that democratic uh, state? Uh, where where uh, Muslims, Jews, and Christians can live as equals under the law. How optimistic are you? Well, it depends how hard we work. I think if we get our act together, like Dr. Mustafa said, if we get organized, we can do this right away. I don't know why we should wait. I think any expectation that there will be a better future as long as Israel exists is absolutely ludicrous. The two-state solution, by the way, was born dead. It was never intended to ever happen. You know, and I believe that Oslo was a great success. It led, Oslo, the purpose of Oslo was to lead to what is happening today. You know, so I, I think we need to kind of reframe how we talk about these issues. There was never any intent by the Israelis, certainly, to, for, to allow for a two-state solution. It's either an Israel or peace. It's either the Zionist settler colonial project or a free democratic Palestine with equal rights. And I would add to that, making sure that mechanism mechanisms are put in place to allow the refugees to return. So the right of refugees, the right of return is not a is not just a slogan or a bumper sticker, but mechanism has to be put in place um, to allow them to return. So I think this can happen immediately. I don't know why we need to wait or why we need to hope that our children will do it. We can do this. We need to organize. We need to change the conversation, make sure that in the halls of power, there is no other conversation. There is a peaceful resolution to the genocide of Palestinians. There is a peaceful resolution to Palestine, which will benefit everyone who lives within uh, historic Palestine. It is a free democratic Palestine with equal rights. That is it. That is it's, it is very, very simple, actually. The focus has to be dismantling the apartheid regime. There is an uh, there is an Amnesty International report that gives us the tools, all the tools and all the data we need to fight that. And there's a vision of a free democratic state, which is not, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We've seen other countries go from fascism and apartheid to democracy, you know, in, in all of our lifetimes. I mean, Spain used to be a fascist regime and there was a civil war. They mended it and they have a democracy. You know, so it's not outrageous to assume and to expect that we do this and we need to do this now. It is imperative. Our generation must deliver. We can no longer allow in our, in our watch this genocide that has been going on for almost 80 years to continue. It is up well, to us. Uh, a to note do. of urgency there from Miko Pellet. Urgency and clarity. Just what we need. I think it's been a splendid argument, debate. I thank Dr. Mustafa Barghouti and Miko Pellet, our distinguished panel guests, but also the good people of the wall. Uh, from Valencia to New York and twice to Yorkshire, we toured the horizon. We toured the world. If you want to be a part of this show and have it out with Galloway, then go to our website, haveitoutwithgalloway.com. Come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. Thanks for watching.